Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this um, second lecture in our series uh, on our changing world. My name is Mank Dutia. I'm in the um, uh, School of Biomedical Sciences here at Edinburgh University. Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted to see uh, such a good turnout again for this lecture tonight. Um, if you were here last week, then I welcome you back. Um, if this is the first of these lectures that you have um, come to, then I do hope you will uh, find this an enjoyable and a worthwhile uh, evening. Um, the aim of these lectures, of course, uh, is to raise awareness and generate discussion about the global uh, challenges that face society, and in particular, the role of uh, academia and academic research, university research, in addressing these challenges. We're extremely fortunate uh, here in Edinburgh to have a wide range of world-class research being carried out here uh, on uh, a wide range of disciplines by internationally recognized researchers who are um, leaders in their respective fields. And one of the aims of this lecture series is to uh, share this pool of expertise and knowledge more widely with the general public, but also with our own undergraduates and postgraduate students to uh, try and get them to uh, think in a broader and uh, more interdisciplinary way uh, about these global challenges. <coughs> these lectures have also uh, been of interest to uh, teachers and uh, pupils in local schools in the region. If there are any school children here tonight, then I particularly welcome you, and I hope that you will find this to be uh, an uh, exciting and stimulating as well as an enjoyable experience tonight. Our lecturer tonight is a distinguished climatologist, uh, Professor Gabriela Hegerl, uh, who is the Professor of Climate System Science in the School of Geosciences here at Edinburgh University. Gabriele has a distinguished reputation and a high international uh, standing for her work in climatology, climate variability, climate extremes, and climate change over the past millennium. Gabriele has published some of the first studies that demonstrate that uh, the influence of humans on surface temperatures is detectable and can be separated from the underlying natural influences um, uh, which interact. Gabriele also is interested in um, estimating the sensitivity of global temperature changes to greenhouse gas levels, and she has recently been uh, involved in the first study, which demonstrates again that the recent changes in precipitation, which have caused such devastation in parts of the world, can be attributed to changes in uh, greenhouse gas uh, dynamics. Gabriele also serves on a number of national and international uh, committees. Um, particularly, uh, she was the contributing lead author for an important chapter on understanding and distributing climate change for the IPCC um, fourth assessment uh, report in 2009. And at the moment, uh, she is currently again a lead author for the upcoming IPCC fifth assessment report for which work is <coughs> proceeding at the moment. So I'm absolutely delighted to have Gabriele here to give this uh, talk for us tonight. And I invite you to come and give your lecture on climate change, past, present, and future. Good evening, the sister. So the um, 
the question if carbon dioxide can influence climate has um, started to be thought about in the actually in the 19th century when people started wondering if you can explain the ice ages with carbon dioxide variations and has been on and off the radar for a while but started to come back very strongly on um, the um, scientific agendas when um, in 19, I think 1958 a graduate student was asked to record the carbon dioxide levels on Mauna Loa in Hawaii um, which and the measurement that, ensued, that started then and has been continued until the present time is shown on this diagram. So this is supposed to, this has been called one of the most influential geoscientific measurements of the um, 20th century. What you see is um, the year at the bottom, so 1958 or so it started and this is going to very recent times. Um, I've downloaded this from the uh, um, National Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences um, web page and it shows the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere in parts per million. Um, and you can see when you look at this diagram in red you can see two distinct features. One is that it has a very strong seasonal cycle, so you just these little wiggles in time every year, so every one of these little bumps is a year. What happens in this seasonal cycle is that the, um, when the northern hemisphere is in summer, the trees leave out and take up carbon dioxide and you get, you go to the to, you get a down bump and then you get a slight up bump when the northern hemisphere is in, in its winter because the northern hemisphere has more land and has therefore a stronger influence. But the more, um, maybe the more prominent feature even is this increase in the 20th century. So um, this increase in carbon dioxide concentration can be tracked back to the burning of fossil fuels. There's a variety of ways you can do this. The strongest one is um, the carbon isotope um, composition in the CO2 is um, points at fossil fuels. You can also try to establish a budget, see how much carbon dioxide you should get based on estimates of what has been burned. Um, and um, you can also see that oxygen levels are decreasing at the rate that carbon, um, that carbon from fossil fuels is um, burned. So this, um, the, the IPCC concluded that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing due to um, human activity and there's no um, qualifier or likelihood because that is pretty much established beyond doubt. We can go back further in time um, than this measurement and um, wonder how unusual these present carbon dioxide levels actually are. And that, is, that can be done by using, looking at ice cores. Um, this is, um, I swiped this from, a, um, from one of the paleoclimate um, websites and it shows an ice core and these ice cores have tiny little bubbles that preserve very ancient air. And you can measure the concentration in carbon dioxide in these ice cores. And um, it shows that the um, concentration, the IPCC report in 2007 concluded that it, the uh, carbon dioxide concentration is now higher than it was for more than 650,000 years ago. There have since been studies pushing this even back further in time, 800,000 or so years. The concentration for other greenhouse gases is higher than at least in the last 10,000 years. So people are, um, so there is a very strong evidence that we have, we are, in, we are putting carbon dioxide levels into the atmosphere that are unusual relative to a, for relative to what we have, um, what Earth has experienced for a very long time. So why worry about this? It is still a small part of the atmosphere and um, to consider that you have to think about the greenhouse effect. So I think probably most of you have seen slides like this or um, explanations like this. So what, we, what the Earth does is it gets the um, energy from the sun um, and then some of the incoming solar radiation gets reflected by the atmosphere, by clouds, or um, some of it gets reflected by white parts of the Earth's surface, such as snow or ice. Um, the rest of it heats the Earth's surface, and then the Earth radiates um, back out to space, um, thermal radiation, infrared radiation, and um, to stay um, in an en to uh, maintain energy balance, which all physical systems have to do, you um, have to radiate out as much energy as comes in. Now if you increase the level of um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, um, you, um, more of the radiation that goes out, this heat radiation that goes out away from the Earth gets um, absorbed on its way out into space and it is basically 
first off, this is a very important natural effect, whoops, which keeps the Earth inhabitable. So without greenhouse gases, we would be about 30 degrees colder. So the, the, the greenhouse effect, the natural greenhouse effect is known, established, and, um, and very important. If you increase the greenhouse gas level in the atmosphere, it's like adding a blanket when you um, blanket to your bed or something. Basically, you have you now may, um, absorb more outgoing radiation and it stays warmer. You have to raise the temperature of the Earth to re resume energy balance. So it's a relatively straightforward physical process um, that basically is based on energy balance. Measurements from space show that the um, outgoing radiation from the planet Earth um, has these little dips that increase over time um, where you expect them from carbon dioxide. So the, the frequencies that are particularly, um, the frequencies that get absorbed by carbon dioxide um, molecules are absorbed increasingly and you can see that from space. So it's, so it's um, very clear that greenhouse gases are increasing and that they change the energy balance of the planet. The question is then, by how much, do, how much does this affect temperatures and does the Earth, um, do the feedbacks in the Earth system make this change bigger or smaller? That is basically the hotly debated um, issue. And before I go into um, the evidence for um, temperature actually warming in response to greenhouse gas increases, I want to briefly go and explain the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change because it has been in intensely in the media in the last year or so. So it was the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and this is lots of text, I apologize for that. This is the textiest slide I have. Um, was, and what all this text is um, cut out and um, distilled from the IPCC webpage. So um, the I IPCC was established in 1988 by the United Nations Environmental Programme and by the World Meteorological Organization. It is um, a, a scientific body that, um, that is, has been tasked to provide the world with a clear scientific view on the current state of um, climate science and its environmental and socioeconomic consequences. So the, what hap the IPCC is a tiny, tiny operation. It, it's, um, it has only very few staff. Um, it's um, pa Pachauri, the um, chair of IPCC, is, um, has a day job. Um, and it's basically thousands of scientists that review and assess the most re relevant scientific literature. An important point that, is, that has always been, as far as I know, on the IPCC webpage is that the IPCC reports um, acknowledge and discuss differing viewpoints within the scientific community. So that's, to me, very important. If there is serious evidence on both sides, it has to be discussed. And um, sometimes the author team decides to take a side by, if they feel the evidence is much stronger on this side than on the other side, but, um, the, but any disagreements or um, scientific disputes are, are going to be um, resolved in the IPCC reports. Um, so personally, I found the um, scientific rigor very satisfying and um, found it a very interesting experience. So what the IPCC um, actually does is, is it produces reports like this. So this is the Working Group 1 report. This is one of the three 2007 reports. The first 15 or so pages of this are the summary for policymakers. So this is basically the distilled summary that is the most important um, result from the IPCC writing. So what happens throughout writing the report is that each author team gets tasked with a topic and it's about 10 authors or so in, on a topic, and they write on the order of 100 pages on their, most, on their subject. For example, for me, I led the, the author team on understanding and attributing climate change, so determining the causes of um, recent and longer-term climate change. And we wrote our 100 pages, which are somewhere in here, <laughs> and um, then distilled down the most important findings into a, an executive summary, and then, um, um, a little group the, that writes the summary for policymakers distills that down for, from the entire report, from this whole 900 or so pages, into these 15 pages summary for policymakers. And those are uh, collected by the scientists and then presented to the policymakers. What happens then is um, it goes for lots of rounds of review um, on the order of three official reviews, and then there is a small short review beforehand. And, um, 
and it goes on all these reviews. And at the very, very end of it, the governments, um, where, where is that? By, so, uh, by endorsing the IPCC report, the government acknowledged the authority of their scientific content. And that endorsing is, it happens in one week, where the United Nations um, panel on climate change meets with the government representatives. And what you see at this bottom here is a, is a picture from um, past midnight on the very last day of this. So you see here the uh, lead author sign. So there's a whole bunch of scientists that look more or less exhausted after one week of this. Um, some of them wear glasses, which are never seen in glasses, because after like 12 hours straight, the contact lenses peter out. And at the very back, um, you see, for example, you can maybe read Egypt here. There's, it's a, not a very good picture. Um, Oh, there's all the government representatives, and every single sentence in these 15 pages for policy, in the summary for policymakers, gets projected and discussed in plenary. And the policymakers can raise objections: Is this too strong? Is this consistent with the scientific evidence? And so on. And and every sentence that you now read in the summary for policymakers has been endorsed by all the governments that are um, involved in the process. So it's a very um, for me, the, a very satisfying thing as a scientist is that these lead authors have a flag just like a country. And so we are able to say, whoops, this is totally inconsistent. What you're trying to do here is not, no longer consistent with the science. So it's, um, there is a lot of safety checks to make sure that it doesn't, the um, governments don't change what we feel is um, the scientific, scientifically um, reasonable conclusion. And a very important sense is on policy relevant yet policy neutral. So the IPCC is supposed to provide information to the public that is scientifically rigorous and is not supposed to give advice of what to do now. We are only supposed to give information uh, that then the policymakers can use to form their decisions. And that's also important to me. I think otherwise, if you start mixing those two levels up, it's, it's very risky. You've all heard about Glacier Gate. So um, that is, um, I've printed here the, the two statements, the, 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 the okay statement that was in the, sum, in the summary for policymakers, not of this, in, not in the working group one, which is the physical science basis, but the impact of climate change book, which is about the same, level, same thickness and has again these 15 ish pages in the beginning and then lots of deep fine print. And somewhere in the fine print, in a, in, a, in a chapter six, which is the Asia chapter case studies, it had a statement about the disappearance of the Himalayan glaciers that is just plain ridiculous. It was what, what happened, so rumor says what happened is that um, a journalist interviewed a scientist, misheard the numbers, and wrote it then in the New Scientist, which then was picked up by the World Wildlife Fund, and, um, and then cited by the authors of this box in the, um, in the chapter on Asian climate change. So this is a case of what we call gray literature. Gray literature is, is literature that is not peer reviewed, that is not the highest scientific standard. On the other hand, particularly when you talk about impacts of climate change on a regional basis, you are often have to use these kinds of literature because there is not enough um, peer reviewed um, international literature available. So we have to be even more careful in its use of this. And the IPCC commented that it had a, that was a case of poor application of well-established procedures. Um, so what, what, is, what, what I want to stress, that the statements from that chapter that made it to the public, um, that, were, that me were meant for public distribution, for example, the summary for policymakers, has no problem. The, the statements are fine and scientifically justifiable, and they have to be much, much more carefully vetted than these, the, the, the fine print deep in the report. But um, it's still very embarrassing that this statement survived and nobody noticed it during all these rounds of review. So um, given this and the climate gate, which was emails stolen and lots of, um, lots of um, accusations floating about, which have been largely refuted. So I'm not going to go for climate gate at this point. Um, all this triggered um, the Inter-Academy Council to um, review the IPCC. And so um, they published their report in August this year and say that the IPCC process has been successful, but it must continue to adapt to the increased interest in climate change. So they have make some recommendations, for example, restructuring, um, 
the executive, particularly having a chairperson that serves for shorter terms, improving the review process, which is very important because when you write a chapter, um, you get, we got on the order of 3,000 comments to which we had to respond to in writing. And some of these, some of these, these 3,000 comments are really very perceptive and important comments that you have to think carefully about. Many of them are, yeah, um, punctuation or something like this, and, and others are just not very well informed. And so it's a challenge to deal with these comments and do, and, and do the science justice without being um, distracted into responding to all 3,000 of them in, um, in polite language. <laughs> <laughs> so this, you can actually look at the I, AR4 um, at the AR4 comments. They are available. You can look at the comments and at the author's responses. The polite language was a, a bit of a joke because we got 500 identical comments, and at the 499th one, we are really challenged to stay polite, <laughs> but we I think we managed. <laughs> so um, and then it wants um, there's a suggestion of a best better communication strategy um, language on uncertainty needs to be better synchronized ac across the different working group which has been happening right now I got the draft of a in, of um, the new guidance on uncertainty today so this is actually was already well underway before these findings and if you look at if you want to see more about this you can look at it on the web page so basically um, I'm I'm now um, presenting the findings as um, summarized by the IPCC or updated, although this glacier is just, um, this glacier thing is just um, from the upper Grindelwald glacier. So um, the, the question I want to address, is it actually warming? And um, the glaciers are the easiest way to see this, but they are not the most um, relevant scientific data, but worldwide, and particularly in the Alps, the glaciers have been um, retreating quite um, dramatically. This is 1937, and this is the present. So the upper Grindelwald glacier was reaching far into the valley and is now um, very high up the mountain. And this is something that you can observe over most of the Alps and is um, worldwide widespread. Glaciers are very dynamic, so you will find occasional glaciers advancing. But on the overall global glacier mass balance, ma glacier mass is, is, is decreasing. The most important data set to um, demonstrate what the Earth's surface temperature is doing are the surface temperature data that have been assembled um, in two places worldwide, or actually three places, um, at the University of East Anglia in, in um, collaboration with the Met Office and um, NASA GIS in New York. But what actually what underlies these are these kind of little temperature measurements that you see on the screen, on the, on the bottom of the screen. So this, this is a little box that has a thermometer. And over many places of the world, these little boxes have measured temperature since um, a very long time. You can see that the time series starts in, 18, in the 1850s. And what you then do is you have, you take, in every region, you collect, you look at your time series that have been recorded. You take an, you, Make calculate every year as a deviation from some long-term mean because it's much easier to produce an deviations from the Earth's average temperature than to produce an unbiased estimate of the Earth's temperature because you would have to go high up on the mountain and all the way into the interior of Antarctica and so on to be to get the real mean. But it's much. But um, if you want to just establish if a given year is warmer or colder than an average year, you can do this with um, even with the station network that we have at present much easier. So what you see here is not the average temperature of the Earth, but deviations from the mean of 1960 to 1991. So if you look at this time series, you can see that it's about zero. It should be zero from 1960 to 19, 1961 to 1990. So every, every one of these stations gets the mean 60 to 1990 taken off, and then they get regionally averaged, and then they get globally averaged, and then you see a resulting bar like this that, for example, says that the year um, 1851, or is, could be 1850, um, was four, about four-tenths of a degree colder than an average year. And if you look at the long-term evolution of this, you can see that it was quite cold in the 19th century. Then there was a quite drastic warming in the early 20th century um, that peaked in, um, in the early 1940s. Then the temperature stayed flat or even cooled a little 
up to the 1970s and then started warming up quite strongly again. Um, this time series is, ends with 1909. 11 of the 12 warmest years happened in the last 12 years. So this is the um, series, this is the order of the warmest years. 1998 is still the warmest year on record. So this is this peak. This was a year with a um, known and understood El Nino event, which is a, when the tropical Pacific um, moves warm water at the surface, which gets you globally unusually warm temperatures. This was a quite strong one, and we haven't had a strong one since then. Strong one like that since then. 2005 is the second warmest years. The other data set, NASA GIS, has 2005 as the warmest, so there's some uncertainty in the order, but the overall shape is um, quite robust. So the Earth's surface temperature has been warming over the 20th century, but not just as a, as a line, but with lots of variability on top of it. The IPCC concluded that warming of the climate system is unequivocal. That was not just based on the surface temperature warming, but also on the increasing global ocean temperatures. So the ocean temperatures have been measured since about 1950, um, based on widespread melting of snow and ice. So the April snow cover has decreased, glacial mass has worldwide decreased on average. Um, rising global mean sea level. That sounds like something that is not a temperature measurement, but it is a temperature measurement because a warming ocean expands. And so a warming ocean will um, rise, raise the sea level. And, what, and the very end of this, the, this red little wiggle is the satellite era. So it has been, the warming has, the sea level rise has been observed over the satellite era. And before then it's based on, on, on tight gauges. It's not an easy measurement to make, make particularly based on tight gauges, but you can see this kind of long-term increase in, in sea level over the 20th century. So it's, it's un, warming is unequivocal. This is basically so many data sets, it's without doubt that there is a long-term warming going on. So why is it warming? The sun could, if the sun changes its, radia its irradiance towards the Earth, that could warm the um, Earth's surface temperature. The sun has an 11-year cycle, so every 11 years approximately, um, there is more sunspots, which, and at the same time, the sun has a slightly increased radiation. Um, it's a, a tenth of a percent, so it's a very small variation, but it is there. And it has been, and there is some estimates that there may have been longer term variations in the sun's output. The climate also responds to volcanic eruptions. So when a volcano erupts, so this is here the Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, in the, which erupted in 1991. It was an a really exciting thing also for the volcanologists because they predicted it enough to evacuate, early enough to evacuate. So it was a very, very strong eruption. And what happens during these very explosive eruptions is that enough sulfate aerosols go into the stratosphere to stay there. So if, if the volcanic dust goes just like Eya um, Fiela Jökul or whatever its name was, it stays within the lower atmosphere, it drains out relatively rapidly. But if it's strong enough to go into the upper atmosphere um, above, where the weather happens, it can um, survive there for a quite long time and build a shield that reflects incoming radiation and makes it a bit colder. This has happened before in time. Krakatawa, for example, in Indonesia was a very um, big one in 1883. Um, greenhouse gases, and we have said before, carbon dioxide has been increasing. The other thing that happens if we burn fossil fuels um, is there's all kinds of pollution associated with it. And um, sulfate aerosols, for example, um, tend to produce, um, tend to reflect some of the incoming radiation. So you're not only having um, warming with greenhouse gases, but you also have local counteracting cooling due to these um, reflective haze. I mean, those of you, probably most of you have observed when you land in a busy city in an airport that you descend into kind of a brownish cloud sometimes. And these things from space are, the really brown ones are actually absorbing and warming, but from space, a lot of this looks white and reflects. So this is basically sulfate aerosols. They, they rain out relatively rapidly, but they reflect some radiation. And the weather varies. So I want to first go for what do we know about um, this? How, how, we do, how do we know that this is not just a long weather variation? So for example, a, a, a really interesting weather variation was the cold winter in 2000, the last cold winter, 2009-2010. So 
So this, I think probably most of you have seen this picture um, of the United Kingdom covered in snow, which is a very rare occurrence, and which um, at the same time, a particular um, climate phenomenon, the North Atlantic Oscillation, was in a relatively cold, uh, in a relatively low state. If the North Atlantic Oscillation describes how much westerly the general wind pattern is um, over the North Atlantic, if it's in a high state, we have generally very strong westerlies. We have stro a stronger maritime climate than average. And if it's in a low state, we have a slightly less maritime climate, more um, cold air outbreaks from the north and from the east. And so this last winter was a very, very negative North Atlantic oscillation, the, the, cold, uh, the most extreme in the last 30 years. And um, there's some long-term, um, some attempts to reconstruct what the North Atlantic oscillation did over long term. And for example, another, uh, the period when it was um, overall um, lowest, based on some estimates, was just at the end of the 17th of um, the 18th century. So we, we, we could possibly <laughs> attribute the skating um, minister also to a low North Atlantic oscillation. But that's very speculative. So basically what this says, if the uh, North Atlantic climate is less westerly than average, we get colder conditions. We go, and we all got quite cold conditions. What is important about these climate variations is that they are not global. So we experience a very cold winter. So this is from the NASA GIS webpage. The winter 2009-2010 was very cold in the UK, in Scandinavia, um, the um, northern Russia, North America. But it was really warm in parts of the Canadian Arctic. It had about uh, up to 10 degrees anomalies. As, um, the um, high Arctic was also unusually warm. And most of the rest of the globe was quite warm on average. So what these weather fluctuations do is they move um, heat around. So it's cold one place, warm another place. That's what makes it maybe so hard for us as um, so hard for everyday experience to understand climate because we, we live so local and experience climate so locally. And it's hard to imagine what, that what we experience right now is very different from what is happening elsewhere. So when we look at the 20th century, so this is now the trend over the entire 20th century. Every little point on the globe that has a red color has experienced warming over the, last, over the 20th century. All the points that are blue have experienced cooling. And you can see that pretty much Everywhere it has been warming, except for um, the North Atlantic, which is very dynamic and has very interesting variability and is warming right now. And um, this southeast corner of the United States, which is a very interesting research problem, what's happening there, actually. So, but otherwise, it has been very widespread warming. This is very atypical for climate variability. The, other th the upper ocean has also been warming, so the heat is not the energy that contributes to warming can't have come from the ocean. And the lower atmosphere is warming. So the whole climate system has been warming. This type of widespread universal warming is um, really hard to explain, can practically not be explained by internal climate variability. So that's why the IPCC concluded that this is extremely unlikely, which we uh, associated with a 5% or less probability, um, to happen without external influences. So just weather variability can't explain the warming. To go further than this, you have to try to produce some model or some estimate of what actually, should, what actually happened in the 20th century. You, you, you have to try to explain the 20th century and what should be happening in response, for example, to how the sun varied, how the volcanoes erupted, um, how the greenhouse gases increased, um, and you can't you can do this with a very, very simple model. You can just estimate the change in the energy balance and then um, account for the fact that the ocean produces a delay. This, you can do a super simple model or you can do a full-scale global atmosphere ocean general circulation model, which, um, of which there are worldwide um, maybe 10 or so. So a, most countries, many countries have a global um, climate model. The UK has um, its... Um, most prominent models at the Met Office. The uh, United States have several models, and so on. And so these models are based on first principles, so conservation of energy momentum, fluid flow equ equations for, um, for the um, science 
um, enthusiasts here. Um, and they have unresolved processes and statistical approximations. What this is trying to tell you is that the models are based on a very physical background, but they have a lot of uncertainty. So these models tell you what should be happening in response to different external influences on climate. For example, um, if you increase um, carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, what should be happening is that you warm the lower atmosphere because you um, absorb more outgoing radiation, and then the upper atmosphere cools because you have less of the radiation arriving there. And that's exactly what has been observed by weather balloon data. So this is a measurement by weather balloon data I got from Ben Santa, which I should have acknowledged, but I lost this little Santa thing. Um, so the, up, the atmosphere is warming up to about the tropopause, and then the stratosphere is cooling, which is exactly what you expect from greenhouse gas increases. If the sun um, would have, um, if the sun would be the major driver of these observations, you would expect warming throughout the atmospheric column because an increase in solar radiation would warm the whole atmosphere, not just the bottom of it. Another kind of fingerprint of um, how climate changes is the time evolution. So you take these models and just chase them through the 20th century and see what happens in response to first solar and volcanic forcing. So we have in the 20th century, so this is 1900 to 2010, there is a number of volcanic eruptions, Mount Pinatubo in 1991, which had the picture before. There is El Chichon, Agung. Um, these are strong volcanic eruptions that would have, a would have caused the global cooling based on the models. And um, you, you also have a small increase in solar radiation in the estimated for the early 20th century. Since about the 70s, we have actually observed, observed solar radiation from um, satellites. And if you chase only these things into a climate model, then every one of these little blue lines is a climate model running through the 20th century with solar and volcanic drivers. And you can see that they produce a lot of variability. They seem to do a somewhat OK job over the early 20th century, but then fail to increase in the late 20th century. So this black, again, is the observations, just as you saw before, just plotted differently. And in blue, we have these different climate models. And the mean of all of them is in this dark blue line. And you can see, basically, the cooling responding to the volcanic eruptions. But um, you can see that the trend in the um, late 20th century just doesn't work. If you put in these natural and the human influences, the greenhouse gas increase in aerosols, you get the red lines from much more models. Much more modeling communities wanted to do that experiment. And um, oops, and you can see that you now can reproduce with the coupled models the 20th century reasonably well. Even the, oh, the strong El Nino in 1998 is not way outside the model range for that time period. You can st still see in the, in the observations and in the models a drop of temperature after <laughs> volcanic eruptions, but you get the increase. So the time fingerprint points at, um, <laughs> at um, both natural and human influences. But then we go much further than that. We, we try to um, explain the observed warming with combinations of patterns um, without greenhouse gases. For example, we try to see what would happen if the solar influence would really be much stronger than the climate models make us believe. Could, could this, the, the pattern um, still match with solar influences, and we find they're difficult or impossible um, or extremely unlikely <laughs> because um, the sun has its 11-year cycle. And so you would see the cycle much stronger than you do, actually, at the surface temperature. If it would have such a strong influence, you would have problems explaining the vertical measurements I just showed you before. And so we have a number of studies that try to determine how can you explain the observed patterns of change in the surface temperature, in the ocean temperature, in the atmosphere? And all of them conclude that um, you need greenhouse gas increases to explain the late 20th century warming. So um, what the IPCC concluded is that anthropogenic greenhouse gas increases very likely caused most of the warming since the mid 20th century. Underlying this is a statistical estimate of which combination of Drivers explains the 20th century using many different climate models that is actually much 
has, is much stronger than this very likely statement which says that it has a 10% chance of being wrong. It's actually more on the 1% range, but then we have uncertainties that are difficult to account for, like in the remaining uncertainties in the modeling and the observations. And so we basically, as experts in the whole um, IPCC community, we had ex have experts on observations and on the models and on, um, assess that this could really, even these uncertainties could not dis derail this finding. So um, a question that then arises very easily is, we know that climate varied all the time, so why would this 20th century be different? We know, for example, that the little ice age around the um, 17th century was very cold. We know that the um, Vikings settled Greenland in the medieval warm period, so we know that climate has changed over the um, last millennium and before, and so why would this 20th century be, why would we need greenhouse gas increases to explain the 20th century if climate varied so strongly before? And so we have to look at indirect data for what actually happened over the last millennium. It's very difficult to estimate how, clim how temperature globally varied over, the, over a long time period. What you see here is the northern hemispheric mean temperature estimated from indirect evidence. For Europe, we are actually very fortunate. We have a lot of long time series. For example, central England has a time series that goes very back, it goes far into, into the 1600s. Um, we have a number of really long time series, but most places in the Northern Hemisphere, you have to take indirect evidence, which you can use to learn about temperature in the past, such as tree rings, tree ring data from trees that grow either high up on mountains where they are very stressed out if temperature fluctuates much more than by rain fluctuations, or um, which grow in high latitudes. So there are some trees that respond clearly to temperature, and you can see that if you look at, if you compare their ring widths or densities with nearby stations. And so there's a whole industry of research trying to reproduce these estimates of how temperatures varied in the past. There's even a very, uh, there's even an, um, an, a reconstruction based on the glacier extent, um, and, there's a, and there's several reconstruction based on the ground temperature into boreholes. So what they give you is some, this kind of gray swath of um, sh this, these shades of gray of what temperature in the northern hemisphere could have been like in the last millennium. So these kind of, you have this broad range where it's kind of fat and black, it's where the data all agree, where it's broad and gray, it's where the data don't agree so very well. And so if you look at these gray ranges, you can see that this is the 20th century, which we of course have with from the um, from the instrumental observations. You can see that the early 19th century was very cold. The data are in very strong agreement on that. The um, 17th century was very cold. The early 20, uh, the early millennium was possibly quite warm. How warm it was is actually very hard to determine. Um, but we also know that even before we started burning fossil fuels, the Earth has not just been varying due to, has not just been varying climate due to natural influences, but has been responding to external drivers. So we, what you see here is volcanic influences, for example. These are estimates of when volcanoes erupted. Some of them, some of these eruptions are known from, from records. Some of them are estimated from ice cores. You can see um, volcanic, um, aerosols in the, um, or volcanic spikes in, in some of the ice cores on Greenland and um, Antarctica. And there have been, for example, in 1815, has been a very dramatic volcanic eruption that caused the year without a summer, the Mount Tambora, which caused a very cold summer in North America and was um, quite likely associated with that volcanic eruption. 1883 was Tambora. There were whole strings of volcanic eruptions, sometimes more, for example, in the 17th century, you see quite a few. There has been a bit of a hiatus in the um, 11th and part of the 12th century. And so the volcanoes changed. The sun possibly changed its brightness a little bit as well. I mentioned before that the sun um, undergoes this 11-year cycle where you get sunspots, sometimes sunspots, sometimes not. When it, when it does sunspots, it's a, light, a tiny bit brighter. People have observed in the 17th century that the sunspots didn't appear for quite a while. So, um, we, so there is a, 
the idea, so you see this in this kind of solar reconstruction that estimates that the solar brightness, the solar could have, the sun could have sent a little bit less energy towards the Earth in the 17th century than it, it does right now. The estimates vary. You see the blue line goes kind of, gives you a, a bigger change than the orange line. Most recent <coughs> estimates are quite small, but the sun did possibly cause some climate fluctuations. And if you stick these things into simple climate models, you get these colored lines, and you can actually reproduce the last millennium quite well, even with very simple models and also with complex models. So you get these kind of warmer conditions and the re really cold conditions in the 17th and early 19th century just in response to external drivers. So we can actually understand what happened to climate in the last millennium and why it happened. And the question, if the early millennium was comparable to the 20th century is the least relevant question when you discuss these records, in my mind. It's, it's much more relevant to see, did climate vary in response to external drivers or spontaneously? And there's a lot of evidence pointing that on these large scales, for looking at the Northern Hemisphere as a whole, a lot of these variations were actually not spontaneous. So, um, so Climate varies, it responds to changes in um, external, in its, in its energy balance. So um, we are continuing to burn carbon dioxide. <coughs> what is going to happen in the future based on the models that you have seen now run through the 20th century <coughs> and the last millennium? So this is again the models running in the 20th century and what you see here are the IPCC projections for the 21st century for te global mean temperature. The first thing is this orange line at the bottom. So this is again global surface warming. You can see that the 20th century warming of a bit less than a degree is um, relatively small on that scale. And this orange line is what would happen if we could spontaneously freeze the concentration of carbon dioxide and everything in the atmosphere. You would still see a little bit of a warming, a slowly moving warming through the 21st century, which is, which is because the ocean is still trying to equilibrate with the, um, this influence that we are exerting on the um, Earth's energy budget. It takes a very long time for the information to, to, to reach the bottom of the ocean, and so it takes a very long time for the Earth's energy balance to get back into equilibrium. However, if we, um, without mitigation, based on a variety of scenarios, so for example, B1 is a, is a scenario where we have a relatively sustainable development, the Earth moves towards a more homogeneous society and so on, um, and the red one is um, a scenario of future um, population changes and um, energy use and fossil fuel consumption that is more on the intense side. Then you get various levels of warming in the 21st century, all of which are quite a bit more than what we have observed in the 20th century. So this, these colored bars are based on just running models. What the gray bars then give you is a 66% is a uncertainty range based on what we have now observed. So we can take the 20th century, say how much of the warming can we really confidently associate with greenhouse gas forcing, and that gives you a little bit larger uncertainties because it is harder to rule out that <coughs> the response is a bit smaller or a, lot, or a lot larger than the models estimate. You see that these error bars are a bit asymmetric. So these are projected uncertainty is ba based also on observed changes, based on lots of things, estimates of how models are uncertain and so on. So the future warming is uncertain, but it's very likely larger than the past warming. The warming varies um, spatially. You, have, you expect more warming in the high latitudes in the Arctic than, um, for example, over the North Atlantic. But for impacts of climate change, what is also very important is how precipitation will change. And there is um, a figure from the models that shows expected changes in precipitation at the end of the 21st century. This is winter on the left-hand side and summer on the right-hand side. When you look at where does this come from, um, precipitation changes come from two, from two mechanisms. First off, a warmer atmosphere contains more water vapor. That's a very basic physics. But then the circulation of the atmosphere makes sure that this increased um, water vapor falls down as rain in the wet regions. So the wet regions get wetter, 
and the dry regions get actually drier in the, in the projections. So when you look at this, for example, you see that the northern hemisphere in winter, in the, um, in, in, the, in the cold hemisphere, you get increases in rainfall wherever it's blue, and you get increases up to 20 30% in the high latitudes in winter in the northern hemisphere. You get increases around the equator, where it's um, in the uh, rainy region around the, um, where the atmosphere has its ascending motion, and you get decreases in the subtropics which in winter stretch up um, almost to the Mediterranean. Where you see a little black dot, the models agree on the sign. Where you see a white color, the models don't agree on the sign, and this, the change is very uncertain. Precipitation is very difficult to get right. Um, summer hemis in, in summer, you see this drying area moving a bit further north. It extends into the um, southern half of the United Kingdom. I can't really tell you what will happen to Scotland. <laughs> so um, we are just at the edge, so nobody knows. Um, the observations actually already show changes in rainfall that are similar to what is projected for the 21st century. The observations show decreases in subtropical precipitation. They show increases in high latitude precipitation and um, increases in a region around the equator. And we have, um, and the slightly disconcerting finding is that these increases that we now observe are actually larger than what we expect for the future. And this is already pretty bad. A 30% decrease in precipitation is associated with major drought. It's a pretty substantial drought in most regions. So, um, so the precipitation changes could have lots of impacts. Another high impact topic is extremes. This is Hurricane Katrina heading for New Orleans. Tropical cyclones are really, really difficult to model. They are, of course, um, they show us how vulnerable we are to climate, even as a um, 21st century society. It's very difficult to say what will happen to tropical cyclones. The, um, there is some indication that the most intense ones will get more intense, but also that Overall, they will decrease in number. Katrina was probably just a natural phenomenon to its, at least to the, its largest part. It's very, very difficult to um, say any more than that, and I, I think it would be totally unjustified. So there is a chance that the most intense hurricanes get more intense, but it's, it's really uncertain. And, and so for me, Katrina was a demonstration of our vulnerability, but not more. And I, I, I gave a, a climate change class in the States um, before Katrina happened, and I'd had New Orleans as a case study for vulnerability because of its low-lying um, situation, sea level, and so on, so that New Orleans would be exposed to sea level rise and to um, tropical cyclones, and it is. Um, forest fires in Greece in 2007. Forest fires often um, respond to heat waves, or you, you get more forest fires under hot conditions. 2007 was a pretty hot year in Greece. Um, there are some projections that say that the, one of the impacts of climate change will be a quite drastic increase in the probability of forest fires in, in, the, for, in the fire prone areas. Heavy precipitation is globally expected to increase, but a single event is very difficult to pin down to um, anything. So there is interesting science going on trying to understand how can you attribute, how can you determine how climate change has changed the probability of some event like flooding. Um, for example, the Pakistan, the Pakistan floods, how, how much of that is due to just random variability, how much of that would have happened anyway, and how much of this risk, change in risk, has been due to clim climate change, just in the same way as medical research deals, um, tries to um, relate smoking to cancer, where you can't tell, say, your grandpa has lung cancer because of his smoking, but you can say that his chances of d developing it are increased. So my conclusions, greenhouse warming has very likely already influenced global temperatures and will continue to do so. The chance that the warming is small, which is, is very is slim, this is something that you can also estimate when you try to estimate climate sensitivity, which is a really technical topic, so I didn't want to go there. Substantial impacts are expected. Sea level will rise. <coughs> Melting of um, glaciers and ice sheet is expected. For example, 
long-term warming above three degrees globally will probably send the Greenland ice sheet on its way towards melting uh, with uncertainty in the exact numbers. Th there will be ex increased heat waves and there is um, some projections, for example, that global food production will be affected with by very strong warming. So the impacts of climate change are really hard to predict because they are regionally varying. Some regions will have positive impacts or most regions will particularly for very strong warming, um, expect um, negative impacts. And something that to keep in mind is for, mit for um, the topic of mitigation that, we will, uh, that will be discussed next week is if you peak carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it is not very easy to get it back down again because of the way it's going into the ocean and it's, it's in equilibrium between the ocean and the atmosphere. So we have quite strong evidence that climate change is um, is happening and um, it will be for future generations to see how strong it will actually be but if I think about my, my kids I at least would like the public to take it seriously. What we, what we are going to do about this is um, really up to, to the policymakers, and I have no, uh, no input in that at all other than that it is a very serious issue and that we should not um, just blow it away as another uncertain um, projection for the future. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for a very clear and a very interesting lecture. Uh, shall we open it to questions and discussion from the audience? The audience is exhausted. <laughs> Hi, and some of the lobby, anti-climate change lobby groups, have spent an awful lot of money rubbishing the data, mm -hmm. and and the the premise that the, the global warming it, it relates to our activities. How are the IPCC? going to, to challenge that and, and how are governments going to challenge it too because I, I think for a lot of us in the renewables industry we, we feel that there's an awful lot of effort being put into challenging the data and not much mm -hmm. trying to, to prove its certainty. Yeah, it's, uh, it, this is something that I would like a good answer to as well. <laughs> I mean, I think on the long run usually reason prevails but there is uh, definitely have been very interesting spikes in public opinion lately following um, a lot of things that can only be described as campaigns. <laughs> so I think, the, in my view, the best response is still sticking by the science and defending the science and pointing out how robust it is and pointing out that we have considered all these uncertainties. What is frustrating to me as a scientist is that the, um, the objections raised by the skeptics groups are scientifically so stupid often. <laughs> I mean, it's really, it would be really much more fun to fight um, really interesting assertions, but it's often things that ring reasonable um, to um, people who have no, no background in this, but that, that are scientifically totally um, without value. So in a way, I, I, I would find it more interesting to discuss this if it were better um, if the, if the skeptics would raise better, better questions. I think we can learn maybe something from how the discussion about smoking and lung cancer went because there was also a lot of money spent on um, by certain industry groups and I think on the long run reason prevailed but it took a lot of time. And I, don't, I worry that it takes more time than we should spend on this. Yeah. Hello. Um. Uh, let's just say that if all the governments followed IPCC's, like your recommendations in stopping this, what would be a what what would be a good estimate on, like how how much would the CO two levels drop? How much would temperatures drop? Or what's your estimate? What would happen? Mm -hmm. And how long if like we all just followed it suddenly mm -hmm. tomorrow or something like that, or in the near future? 
So we, we don't um, give recommendation about what the government should do. But um, what is happening right now is that for the next assessment report, the um, modeling efforts are in panic state. So the different modeling centers are all just in the process of discovering this or that little bug in their model and rerunning it. And, 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 and um, there's very, very, very busy modeling going on. And the modeling this time is actually um, trying to um, stabilize at certain targets, for example, doubling, um, um, quadrupling, and so on, and, and looking at from the physical climate side, what will this do? What, um, how long will it take to reach equilibrium? What is the sea level rise with it? Sea level rise continues much, much longer to rise after temperature has equilibrated. And on the other side, from the um, socioeconomic side, the groups are working on saying, how could we actually get there? So we are basically starting from this, um, um, con this stabilization target and then going modeling the future and trying to determine how, how would, would it be possible to get there. And, it's, and there are some scenarios that are at this point almost impossible to reach. So it's a, it's a really interesting science question right now. You talked about the grey literature and um, there seems to be a lot of propaganda about um, global warming and I've heard it said that Mars's temperature is rising as well. Um, personally, I'd like to... Mars. Go Mar Mars's, Mars, the planet Mars, mm -hmm. the temperature is ri rising and personally I'd like to go with a precautionary principle and, and you know, try and turn my lights off and things like that and uh, just in case sh the human influence is what the, the media are making out there is. Um, but you talked about external <coughs> factors as well, um, and you seemed quite sort of balanced in, in the way you were talking about the factors that are contributing. Um, so how do we know? What is the evidence for um, how, how much hu human, human sort of contribution is influencing? Mm -hmm. So we, um, this is what, what we use these fingerprints for, basically the pattern of warming in space, in time, up the atmosphere, into the ocean, that can tell you, based on the, on, on the physics at which, um, of what is happening, it can tell you what caused this warming. And so we, we use some estimates from models of what patterns of warming we expect in response to the sun, in response to um, other natural influences, in response to greenhouse gases, and then compare the observations with these so-called fingerprints, we call them fingerprints, um, and see how strong is the fingerprint for human influence on recent climate. And, and, and the studies all come out with a very, very strong influence because the late 20th century is, um, can really only be explained if you account for the greenhouse gas increase. All the other influences really can't match what has happened in the observations. Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Um, I'm interested in the, the data and the precision of the data that you mm -hmm. presented mm -hmm. and you nicely indicated that you were not able to say what sort of weather Edinburgh would be experiencing in the forthcoming future. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I'm interested in wildlife uh, and in the development of wildlife mm -hmm. and I saw in your graphs that there are large areas of the planet for which the data is not sound enough for you to be able to give estimates of mm -hmm. rain and, and dryness. And I wonder, are these gaps being filled up, or is there a plan to fill up these gaps? For those of us interested in, in wildlife movements, we are interested to know what's likely to happen in those white areas. Yeah, the, um, the gaps in the, in the data, and I think it would, would take a while to get back to this slide. If you remember the slide that had the surface temperature increase, that had lots of gaps. and. Um, those gaps are presently um, being filled. This was the, 20, the, the change over the entire 20th century. So we, if we don't have data early in the 20th century, we didn't plot this trend. So you, if you look at today's data, you have a much better coverage. But it's still difficult as the interior, parts of the interior of Africa still don't have 
um, regular measurements. Um, we are losing some measurements from um, the former Soviet Union. Um, and um, so there are still some white areas. The satellite era helps a lot. We can measure a lot of things from satellites that we, um, we don't measure maybe as much from the surface anymore. The last 30 years have also told us that the satellite <coughs> measurements are a bit uncertain because they kind of all change their orbit a little bit and then the new satellite takes over and the way you fiddle the data, you adjust the data to match between different satellites, you can get all kinds of trends. So it's um, observing how our Earth system's temperature is changing is still a priority, I think, and it's, it's, may it's maybe not very sexy to the funding agencies because it's maintaining something that's going on for a long time, but it's very, very important. Um, but I think most places we, we now have reasonably good data. Thanks. Um, what are, in your opinion, the greatest barriers to implementation uh, of adaptation strategies, policies, um, various kinds of measurements against global warming? Yeah, so... Um, it's maybe a bit beyond the scope of the... Yeah, so the next, lecture, lecture, the next lecture is going to be about mitigation, but you're asking about adaptation, and that is, that is w in a way, within the scope of this lecture. So we have to, irrespective of how strongly we manage to mitigate, we will have to adjust to sea level rise, for example, and the Netherlands are worried about that. Um, there's a, a lot of, a lot of long-term infrastructure projects are thinking about climate change. There's been this case, this famous case of the Canadian Bridge, where they have accounted for a possible up to meters of sea level rise. and. Um, this is a bit out of my expertise, but it depends. Um, it's much easier to adapt to climate change for a developed nation with a well-built infrastructure and, um, and good governance. It's harder for developing nations, for nations with governance problems, to, to because they are too absorbed by their day-to-day -day life to adjust to something that is coming their way. Does this answer your question a little bit? Um, a bit, but uh, shouldn't the IPCC like um, address specific issues concerning uh, the limitations to uh, <coughs> mitigation and adaptation? Yes, uh, they have. Recommending so this is basically this is the physical science basis report. There's the adaptation and um, the um, impacts and vulnerability, which is even fatter than this one. And so there is for every um, con continent there is. Um, both possible impacts discussed, and it also goes to some extent to adaptation, but I, I expect that this will happen more in the future. Different countries also do reports on climate change. The United States are supposed to do one again soon, and that, that also discusses how you adapt. But then one more, if I may. If I may. Um, why does it take so long to get consensus, and why, isn't, um, why does Copenhagen fail? Oh, it's a hard problem. I mean, basically, course, we, we all use carbon dioxide. I mean, I drive from East Lothian to Edinburgh almost every day because it would take forever to do it by, by train, and it would just not mesh with the pickup schedule of my children. So, so we all, I think we all are dependent on fossil fuels in the, in the moment, so it's very hard to change that. It's um, an interesting parallel is the Montreal Protocol on the ozone hole, where it was in a way, it's a, an optimistic parallel because it was a problem that was addressed, but it is easier to address the ozone. It was easier to address the ozone hole because there were substitute substances. So you, you could, it was expensive to some extent, and, but you could substitute the CFCs by other substances and the ozone hole is slowly closing. The carbon, the carbon problem is harder because we, are, we don't have really a good substitute right now. We mean the renewable energy sources are struggling to fill, fill the gap and you will learn much more about that in the next lecture. Um, I have a question specifically about um, the average um, temperature observations and the graph uh -huh. that you showed before. Uh -huh. um, I was just wondering, you had data from 1890s to uh -huh. 2010, mm -hmm. but the base year average that you used was only from a period of 1961 to 1990s mm -hmm. or thereabouts. And I was wondering why that 30 year period was chosen, because um, I wouldn't be average across that 30 year period just distort the temperatures from before and after the variation thereof. Or 
Not really. The reason to use 1961 to 1990 was that the World Meteorological Organization recommended that. But there's a good reason to do actually a relatively recent period because for every point that you want to include for every station measurement, you need to have this base period to make sense of it. Otherwise, if you just have 2005 and no idea of what, where this was in 1961 to 1990, you can't really use it. And so if you use um, 1800, um, 1900 to 1910, you would lose a lot of recent measurements to the fact that they, don't, they haven't recorded this early 20th century. So if you take something l later further back in the century, you can actually use a lot more data. Does this make sense? But, and you still don't really get a bias because you just have a different averaging period. It's just an averaging period. I think there's one more. Yeah, I mean, Gabby, this isn't really a question. It's an, it's an observation. It's a contribution into the discussion. David Somerville. Um, I'm, I'm aware that some colleagues have started talking about what we can do and things like that. And mm -hmm. I think I'd like to use the opportunity to indicate how much the university in its own way, through our own estates um, activities, um, are trying to address both the mitigation and increasingly we will have to face mm -hmm. adaptation issues. Now, and I would invite anybody who wishes to take one, um, I have some cards about a project called Transition Edinburgh University, which is looking at ways that low-key personal change C can be initiated um, and, uh, uh, and is possible. And they've got a particular program called Carbon Conversations, which is exceptionally helpful for th those of you who wish to learn a little bit more, um, which is happening and is being launched this, this semester. There's a tremendous opportunity <coughs> for you to meet in small groups to learn a little bit more about some of these complex issues. And then specifically for those of you who are students at the university, there is a, um, a new student-facing website called OurEd, ourred.ed.ac.uk. Um, for those of you who wish to learn a little bit more about these sort of, uh, these sort of issues which um, this excellent lecture series is addressing, and other social justice, environmental <coughs> um, development, and related issues. Mm -hmm. So if uh, 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 there'll be one of us at each door uh, at the end of the lecture, if you want to take Thank that. Thank you, David. I think there's another question behind you. Thanks. Um, I wanted to um, pick you up on the um, millennial temperature record. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's, there's been some contributions to the literature recently suggesting that the uncertainty bands on these reconstructions are, in fact, extremely wide. And I know you, you mentioned yourself the, the, the fact that it's very difficult um, to reconstruct temperatures that far back in time. Now, I was wondering whether there was a, uh, a contradiction between um, those observations and the IPCC's position that um, the modern temperatures are, I think they say, very likely the warmest in a thousand years. Mm -mm. No, nope. they say they're very likely the warmest in 500. That's a big difference. <laughs> okay. So um, they say likely the warmest in 1300 and very likely the warmest in 500. The reason this is, is, uh, this is an issue a bit dear to my heart, the, the reason is that up to about 1500, we have a lot more data. We have long, long in European instrumental series. We have the boreholes, so these holes in the ground that measure ground temperature. We have the glacier-based reconstruction. We have a, a variety of different independent data sets. And it's, it's very robust, and also the data all agree that the um, second part of the millennium was cold early on and then warmed. So this is, a very, this is very robust. You, you can't find, I think it's very hard to find even a single data point that is warmer um, sometime in the last 500 years than it is, is now. But I'm sure there's, there might be some very locally, but it's, you, you, it's, most of them have been cold in the in the, since the 1500s. When you go back 1,300 years, there you can find individual records that were warmer in the medieval warm period. The warmth in that medieval warm period was different, happened at different times in different places. And um, it was not global. But you can find individual records that point at warmer conditions in the late, um, in the, in the early in the millennium, definitely then in the 
early 20th century and in some instances, and that's much more debatable also even the late 20th century. That's why this IPC put this likely tag on it, which means um, um, 60, uh, which, which means that there's a 33 percent uncertainty on that as well. So there's still substantial uncertainty. That accounts for the fact that these reconstructions are uncertain. For example, if we look at our tree rings, it is unclear if the trees really capture all the variability in the past. Some tree ring records don't capture the recent warming, which makes you wonder, did they capture all the warmings that happened in the past? Um, there is uncertainty if they only respond to temperature or if also rainfall changes could have contributed somewhat. Um, every single reconstruction um, data method and um, every single um, proxy that provides you information about temperature and every single method to produce these proxies into some time series has its uncertainties and it's very important to estimate those properly. It's a, it's a really interesting statistical problem because you have so many uncertainties feeding into a, um, into a method. So doing this right is, I think, very important and it's very challenging. And the uncertainties are substantial, but it's, if you just plot the, the, the records on top of each other, which, which hasn't, hasn't been done here, then you see that the early millennium was warm but most places not as warm as the 20th century. Does this make some sense? Wait, I lost my question here. Yeah, I think we have one last question from the front here. Um, just on that same topic, uh -huh. um, I suppose that the uncertainty just goes um, to enormous um, size when you go even further back. But you mentioned that um, the CO2 levels are higher uh, right now than at least for past 650,000 uh, mm -hmm. years. And I wonder what's the data that would should have so show correlation between the CO2 levels going that far back and perhaps some sort of evidence on the climate there was at the time, I suppose it's really hard to capture, but yeah, there are how some well does it correlate, basically? There are some, um, there are some first of the, the, t the climate and carbon dioxide correlate <coughs> fantastically well with um, each other over time. The prob only problem is what drives what. Drives what. And there is um, quite a possibility, I think it's quite reasonable to assume that over a lot of Earth's history, the um, the um, warming and cooling associated with the orbital cycles has driven a lot of the carbon dioxide variations. So, but that's, that's not exactly my research topic, so I have to be a bit careful here. But it's, um, so you have some idea of what happened to temperatures in the past, but it's, and it's quite synchron synchronous with carbon dioxide. Um, there is actually some attempts to estimate how sensitive is the climate to changes in its energy balance. And um, I've done one based on the last millennium, which was fun and statistically quite challenging, just looking at how strong are the wiggles in response to the volcanic eruptions. What does this tell us about mainstream climate models and um, outlier ones with very small or large responses? This has also been done for the last glacial maximum, which is an interesting period. When, so when we had basically a glaciated Earth and um, much lower carbon dioxide, was, the carbon dioxide was so low that the trees had trouble growing. And, um, and um, more, more dust and so on and so and, and people are looking at can the present climate models actually do the last glacial maximum if you stick the ice sheets in them and the dust and everything or the temperatures they produce for the ocean for example are they in agreement with data this is a, a really interesting area because it's a really good model test because the models haven't been exp the models haven't been tuned to to the um, last glacial maximum so it's a re it's much more of a model test than than looking at climatological means for the recent period. Um, and there's some attempts to push this back much further in time. And they all come up with quite consistent <coughs> results that main, the climate sensitivity of, that indicates about two, three degrees warming in response to doubling carbon dioxide is something that is in agreement with data far back in time. So you can actually use the information far back in time, but it's much, much harder to use. Okay, well, Gabby, thank you very much indeed for an excellent lecture and for dealing with these questions in such a clear and uh, 
thought-provoking way. That's thank you fun. very thank much you. for uh, coming along tonight and for your participation in the discussion. I hope you'll um, uh, make it to the <coughs> succeeding lectures in this series. Um, we do have uh, these um, lectures up uh, for downloading on the university website, and there is a discussion forum that's associated with each of these lectures. So uh, I hope the discussions will continue online, and I do hope to see many of you back again uh, for uh, all of the remaining lectures in this series. Thank you very much for coming. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.